For years, in talks and papers I've written, I've used the internet-connected toothbrush as an extreme example of our IoT existence. Really, do we have to connect everything? Seriously? Well, as I produced this episode, there was a fake news story that got picked up by several mainstream publications, and it alleged that 3 million internet-connected toothbrushes were hijacked to perform a massive distributed denial-of-service attack on a major company, which went on to lose millions of dollars as a result. Where to begin? A few years ago, there was the Mirai botnet, which used internet-connected surveillance cameras as part of a massive botnet that conducted a distributed denial-of-service attack against an internet provider, Dyne resulting in the loss of service for Netflix and other companies, as well as millions of home internet users left in the dark. That was a documented fact. You see where I'm going with this, right? First, what major company was hit with a massive DDoS attack that it cost millions of dollars? No names, no evidence. And which brand of electric toothbrush? Three million seems like a lot, so maybe it was more than one brand, in which case it was something that was maybe white labeled or say it was an open source package. Well, what was that open source package? The articles I've seen mention some Java OS mumbo jumbo, but that doesn't necessarily make sense either. Internet connected toothbrushes, they would use Bluetooth low energy or BLE, and that would be just like the Fitbit that I wear. And for that to be connected to the internet, the Bluetooth-enabled toothbrush would have to be connected to a Bluetooth-enabled mobile, which has an app, and the app is connected to the internet. But that's not right, since the app probably doesn't have the resources to really contribute in a meaningful way to a significant DDoS attack. So the story falls apart. And I guess I'm just disappointed that the mainstream media would pick up on something like this without asking any of the above questions. I mean, it's almost as though there's an assumption that the Internet of Things devices are by default flawed. Well, maybe that part of the story is true. This is a story about IoT devices, the fact that we still don't understand how vulnerable they are, and whether a proposed IoT labeling for consumer devices like toothbrushes might make any sense. I'm Robert Famosi. This is Error Code. Tom Pace, uh, Grand Supreme Master of the Universe. I love that energy. It's great. However, let's find out about Tom's real job. Uh, Tom Pace, co-founder and CEO of NetRise. Okay, that then begs the question, what is NetRise? NetRise is a company that provides visibility and risk identification uh, into a class of devices that historically have had none. Uh, Those devices would include, but not be limited to, IoT industrial control systems, medical devices, embedded systems and vehicles, satellites and telecommunications equipment. So when Thomas talked about his company, he said that they were addressing something that wasn't addressed. And that's the industrial space. Or is it just IoT? One of the things I was tasked with at DOE was basically saying, can you tell us if we're impacted by this particular vulnerability or risk associated with whatever, you know, uh, this third party component, this vulnerability, whatever. And I remember like the first time I got asked that question, I was like, yeah, seems like pretty straightforward. Um, And then what I realized very quickly was not straightforward and basically impossible, right? So, okay, let's, let's think about it traditionally. How do I determine if I have a vulnerability on my laptop, desktop, or server? Well, I run a vulnerability scan on it. And you know, there's different levels of that. Is there an agent on that? Is it a credentialed scan? Is it whatever? There's ways that get varying levels of depth. Now give me a security camera, a router, a printer, a industrial control system, a remote transmission unit, a programmable logic controller, a whatever. How do you do it there? A vulnerability scan doesn't do it. That's for sure. You can't install an agent. You can't do a credentialed scan in the majority of cases. 
Um, there's, there's some things you can do, but they're not scalable. They're not consistent across device types or manufacturers or verticals or, 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 or. And so the ability to answer just basic questions about anything related to these devices is basically impossible for 99% of people on planet earth right now. So, and how can that be the case when all we talk about is how critical, literally by definition, the infrastructure is when I can tell you every single process that's running on Tom and accounting's laptop, but I can't tell you if there's an open source component on a thing pumping billions of dollars of natural resources through pipelines um, is 10 years old or not. Like, how is that the state of affairs? But that is exactly the state of affairs. This is why I wanted to talk with Tom. This is a good dose of harsh reality that we need to hear. We have millions of devices out in the field and no clear way to access the state of risk each poses within our critical infrastructure. So what recourse are you left with? You either A, hire 10 million firmware reverse engineers um, to do it that way, which newsflash, not going to happen. Or there, there are some capabilities out there now, right? Like this is a nascent market for literally the oldest problem in cybersecurity, which always makes me laugh. Everyone's like, oh, this is like a new problem, Tom. I'm like, what? It's literally the oldest problem, like by definition, unless we've changed what the definition of like old is. But th these things have been being compromised since the early 1980s because they were the only things that existed. There wasn't, the Windows operating system didn't exist. So all of the, this is all that was being compromised. I get that too. People say, oh, this podcast, it's about OT security. Is that new? Well, no. Before we had connected devices, we had these devices out in the field. And the problems that they've had, well, they've had them for 20 to 30 years. They're more critical today since we are connecting them to the internet. So this idea that this is a new problem is just like hilarious to me. And I hear people say it all the time and I'm just like, okay. The, the only other recourse you're basically left with then is reaching out to the device manufacturers. They have the exact same problems. They have the exact same problems, right? We think there's a cyber skills gap, generally speaking. Go find me the product security cyber skills gap, orders of magnitude bigger, requires significantly different levels of understanding of a number of things. And so not to mention, they have the same third party supply chain problems that the end users of their devices have. People think that these device manufacturers write every line of code that's on their device could not be further from the truth. So th these problems just like keep going and going and going and going. So that's the state of affairs that we're currently operating in. So Tom mentioned that NetRise reports back on the risk of threats presented by these devices. Sometimes that's a matter of seeing whether a CVE exists for it. But I also know that the CVEs, when you get to the CVSS calculations, there's a deduction if you cannot physically touch the device, as though the only way to infect something is by physically accessing it. And that's not true. So the severity of a CVE can drop, even though in most environments, it really is severe. It's just an old way of looking at these things. And well, we can do better. CVSS is a terrible way to prioritize anything. That's been proven time and time again. Whenever we interact with companies who say things to us like, yeah, we have to, we patch all of our critical vulnerabilities and whatever, 30, 60 days. I go, I, I'm sorry to tell you guys, it's just a terrible decision. And here's lots of data to support that. So, you know, I, I, I can go through a number of demos and that are not contrived um, at all and show them that let's look at all of the vulnerabilities that exist on this particular thing. Now let's layer on top of that. Are there exploits available for these vulnerabilities? Then let's layer on top of that. Are these exploits being used in the wild? And for those things, I can show just countless examples. And then let's do an and operation on critical vulnerabilities. And then that table is empty. So you're patching vulnerabilities that don't even have exploits because someone in Maryland said it was critical. What? What are we doing? So, you know, 
it's an okay at best starting position. But same thing. It's the same problem, right? Like we're relying on the fe- the federal government, the most resourced, most under-resourced organization on planet earth. They can literally print money. They do for all the worst reasons. But whenever we have actual problems, they decided not to fund those things. So there's also very good data out there to show if you have a thousand vulnerabilities, I, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but the basic story will, will come through. Uh, imagine you have a thousand vulnerabilities and a hundred of them are critical. You reduce the overall risk the same by patching a hundred totally random vulnerabilities and a hundred and the 100 critical ones. And that's been proven time and time again. If that is the case, what are, just, what are we doing? You know, we, we just uh, kicked off an engagement with an, with an organization and they have a very strict vulnerability management policy, which is good. That is good. That's a good thing. And I was like, well, guys, to say you're going to violate that policy in a real big way, in a hurry, is an understatement. You can't patch all of these things. And we're going to give you a lot of additional critical vulnerabilities. But that's not the way to assess the risk of something. It is, it is merely a factor. It's one, in, it's one piece of data to input into the overall calculation. So once upon a time, that probably was the best way to prioritize vulnerabilities. It just isn't anymore. We have more data. We have more context. We have more, you know, more things we can layer on top of that to make better decisions. What then is a better way to evaluate IoT devices? In almost every scenario, leveraging some additional data, I think, is required. So, you know, in the example I just mentioned, just having pulling in is there exploits available for this vulnerability, which is public information. This is not like, you know, you don't have to like work the NSA to figure this out. Now, is it ever going to be perfect? Of course not. So, you know, just because like we might tell you, here's a vulnerability and we can't find any exploits for it. Does that mean there's no exploits for it? Of course not. You know, we can't possibly have access to all information on planet earth relating to a particular exploit being available or not. But that's just one very easy data point. And then you can say after that, what is the nature of the exploits available? Just because an exploit is available does not indicate it's actually being used, right? Like someone might've just wrote one, but it doesn't really work or it doesn't scale or it doesn't whatever. There's a number of things that also need to be met for that to happen. Now, the kind of inverse of that is this concept of vulnerability chaining. So just because you have 10 mediums and four lows. Well, we only patch criticals, Tom. Well, here's a very kind of obvious way. They're not always obvious, frankly, but here's a way that we can take these three vulnerabilities and chain them together. Kind of going back to your point around initially where you talked about the data element around like you need physical access or network access or like whatever. Those things change in a hurry when you start doing vulnerability chaining. You might not need to have physical access now to exploit a particular vulnerability if you've chained it with other ones that you can access over the network. So once again, this is not a new, I'm not, I'm not providing information here. That's a trade secret. This is all, this is all fairly well understood vulnerability prioritization thought processes. Tom touched upon the supply chain, and I'm thinking back to the Mirai botnet, which turned out to be a white label chip that was present in a lot of IoT security cameras. I question the companies that are making these devices. And we need to look back on how they did or did not react to the problem. The ability to react to that has to happen on the front end. You know, I mean, that's that's how that goes. Like a firefighter doesn't show up to a fire and go, man, I really wish we had a way to get water. Uh, Wouldn't that be great? You know, like, what should we do? Well, let's go to the grocery store and just buy a bunch of cases of it and throw it at the house and hope for the best. Like, and that's what, that's basically what, a lot of these companies have done because th- the concept of secure to market does not exist. The concept of time to market does. And by the way, if we sat here and pulled up a whiteboard and, and went through like the, the economic math of that, that would always be the decision we come to. Always. That's welcome to capitalism um, or welcome to just economics, right? You know, good economics does factor that stuff in. Um, I think now there's just better data to feed into that equation. So do I think it's going to change? Like, do I, do I think that 
five years from now, people are going to be releasing products with zero vulnerabilities, 0% chance, absolutely 0% chance. That being said, if you look at this, you know, what's really interesting to me is this is just identical to the problem of Microsoft 25 years ago. It's, 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 it's an identical problem, right? Uh, all these issues existed, um, you know, people were, look, uh, you know, reverse engineering the binaries and finding buffer overflows and proving they could do this and proving they could do that. Um, and that got to a head at some point when someone, I, I once again, I'm going to mess this up, but um, the, the story will come through again, I hope, you know, someone in Congress was basically just like, wait, excuse me? Um, aren't like, isn't like everyone on planet earth using windows? And they're like, yeah. And they're like, well, why are, shouldn't we understand that there's like vulnerabilities and risks in this thing that the military is using and governments is, are using? Like, why are these like four kids in their parents' basements able to just access entire government networks like trivially? And they were like, well, you know, because that's what a monopoly is, you know, oh, well. And then eventually they were like, not only are you going to fix this, we're going to create an entire day for you, right? It's going to be your own special day, Microsoft, and we're going to call it Patch Tuesday, right? Um, and now if you look at something like Windows 11, which took a long time to come out, obviously, let's just take one feature that is a game changer, like only signed code is able to run on the Windows 11 operating system. Revolutionary, guys. And But that's a massive thing, right? But that doesn't happen because they, that doesn't happen out of the goodness of their hearts. I'm just, there's great people at Microsoft, obviously. But you know what I mean? It's just like, that's not how the economics did not align with that being the case. So we're in that same world right now with device security where people are starting to wake up and go, wait a minute, aren't like, aren't all of these computers like in my car and like controlling weapons manufacturing and like flying over my head and doing like really important things. And people are like, yeah, yeah. So I think that's why you're seeing this, like this sea change happening, uh, which is a good thing. Right. To Tom's point, it took Microsoft years to figure all that out. For IoT, this patch and update process, well, it could take even longer to establish. Just the processor architectures are orders of magnitude more diverse. Now, here's the interesting thing that's happening. That's becoming less so um, because more and more things are just running on like embedded Linux because hardware has got to a place where it's just not required, right? Like if you look, you know, I remember looking at automotive firmware 10 years ago, and I mean, it was rough. I mean, now it's just embedded Linux. It just has a Linux operating system on it, right? It's just, it's pretty pretty straightforward. With that also comes, it's easier for attackers to also understand. And so this is just the natural, you know, it's just interesting to me when people are like, oh, it's not, guys, this is just how everything goes, right? Like it's it I, I know exactly how this is gonna go. It's it's just a matter of how long it takes us to get there. That's that's all this is. Right. So I don't know. Maybe like maybe at some point someone figures out we need to have like 15 certified Linux distributions that are developed for certain device types. I don't know. Like whatever. Right. That's essentially what Windows was, right? They had they had a server, they had a desktop version, they had an embedded version, they had a this version. Like it's the exact same thing, but the tail will be longer. So that's industrial IoT. What about those internet connected toothbrushes? Lately, there's been talk about labeling them. Kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval that this device won't be a security risk within your home. How realistic is that? And should something like that be applied to industrial IoT? Frankly, it doesn't really matter because all of it is voluntary. So, um, you know, whether or not it's specifically for consumer-based goods, I think that's probably the, the intention, right? 
because if, if you imagine uh, like industrial IoT or, or just basically non-consumer facing products, supposedly will have some third party risk management process that is followed before they procure things. Now, we all know that that is non-existent in this space. Um, uh, so um, that is just a set of circumstances that are purely imaginary. But um, so I would imagine that the labeling scheme would predominantly be uh, for for consumers, but all of it's voluntary anyways, uh, which is my overarching problem with it. Right. So we've had some of this in the past. Underwriters Laboratory has a paid program where they will look at an Internet of Things device. And, well, we really don't see that UL listing on any of the products today, such as those Internet-connected toothbrushes. So what's compelling companies to do this, if at all? Absolutely nothing. So, you know, what annoys me is they use, they use, <clears throat> they try and compare things uh, that are just not, not even close to what is reality, right? They're like, this is just like the Energy Star certification. No, it's not. Um, it, in fact, has nothing in common with the Energy Star certification, aside from you calling it a certification. Um, so, you know, that is a mandatory thing that has very quantitative metrics that one must achieve to, um, you know, get that sticker on your thing. Um, and just a grand total of zero of those pieces of criteria are present um, in, in the labeling scheme. So, and, and, and by the way, I think there's, I think there are what I would call not bad reasons for that. Um, cybersecurity is not the same thing as electrical engineering, right? If one needs to determine the energy current that is coming from a power source to a refrigerator, it's a very, it's a very fixed function equation and analysis that needs to be conducted. If one wants to determine the risk of an IoT device, that is a that is a wildly abstract thing that requires analysis from ten different domains um, as it as it pertains to you know how susceptible is this thing to being compromised. Uh, now, what 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 is true is that there are a number of very quantitative things that can be measured uh, that that should be mandatory that everyone agrees on, right? So should we use a unique password that meets some set of standard for each device? Like who who is sitting around and raising their hand and saying like, you know what? I don't think we should do that. Because if that person does raise his hand, then just remove that person. Just remove that person from the decision-making process. I believe one of the criteria that they're looking at is whether it has updates and patches. That's something that should not be argued. Of course, it needs to have those things. Of course. It's more so does it have the ability to updates and patches, right? Which is a big difference. And, and, and how do you functionally measure that, right? There's, that's very difficult to do from a third party perspective. So unless we just want to rely on the manu manufacturers and tell us, yep, we can do that. Which, by the way, if that's, the, if that's what we're going to do, Someone please explain to me how that's any different than what we're currently doing. And the answer is it's not. <laughs> then also, we're introducing a different approach to our devices that a lot of people haven't made the paradigm shift for. In other words, you know, it's Patch Saturday. I'm going to go around my house and patch all my IoT devices. No, people don't say that. And people don't usually do that either. No, I mean, so, and, and by the way, the, the companies who do this, what I would consider the best don't even give you that decision. Like, go, go, go update your, uh, your Nest camera. Can't, can't do it. Google updates it for you. They don't ask. They don't ask you if you would like your firmware updated on your security camera. You know why? Because they realize that people don't care. Um, and so they are going to just own that for you. And they do. Um, so new features, new capabilities, new whatever just happens, just happens. Um, and so that is the way in which we should expect kind of change to happen here. Now, you'll always have people who like want to have all this control over this and control over that. And they, 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 they do have Patch Saturday, right? Um, that is a wildly small number of people. 
um, in terms of, you know, percentage of the population, obviously. Um, so this, this, the onus has to be pushed back onto the, onto the manufacturer, just like it's the case in any other, uh, you know, situation. So, you know, like we don't expect, um, our end users. I mean, if you look at like the Tesla model, right. You know, Tesla, it's why they're able to scale and just do all these things so much faster than everybody else. Like, think about how hilarious it is in 2023 that when you buy a, I don't know, whatever, a new BMW, and I'm making this up. I don't know. Maybe BMW can do it too. But like, you're like, oh, you know, there's a problem with my electronic control unit. I got to drive in and have some guy plug in a thing and update it. Like, what? What are we doing? Tesla, you just update your stuff. It's just ready to go. So with the national cybersecurity strategy, and then also with the Patch Act liability that's being pushed down to new medical devices, we're not really talking about that here. The labeling doesn't really have the manufacturers own anything more than they did before. It's kind of for show. I mean, listen, I think it's a, I posted something on LinkedIn about this, like, it's a positive step. It's an acknowledgement that there's a problem and a and creates framework wherein the companies that desire to do the right thing and potentially view that as market differentiation now have an avenue to do so. But that's about all it is. What I think, you know, if you look at the uh, the liability concerns, I, I just haven't seen those have the, the requisite teeth yet. You know, this is where the federal government, uh, once again, I think gets in trouble and is like its own worst enemy is it created all of this hoopla, which is, by the way, amazing. But you can't, you can't like keep threatening and threatening and threatening and threatening. And then when it comes time for the rubber to hit the road, it just never does. And that's where the government is unique. That's what the government can do. No one cares about voluntary stuff from the government. No one. Zero people. Why do people pay their taxes? Because they don't want to go to jail. Not because they like feel it, it's good in their heart to contribute back to the American dream, to pay for programs that they don't get the benefit from at all and send all of our money overseas. That's not why people pay for tax, to pay taxes. They pay for taxes because they are required to do so. It's the only reason, right? And sure, there's going to be a small group of people out there who go, well, I contribute to taxes, Tom, for education. Well, great. Good for you. You're the only one. Um, so the government has the ability to enforce things when they desire to do so. So coming out with a bunch of voluntary stuff is not the way to do it. So, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I'm not in these rooms. So maybe given enough time, uh, this is just like building up the, like the mentality that that is going to happen eventually. But until it does, the discourse will remain in this, in this form where people just talk about it. Tom's background does include working with federal agencies. So he's not coming out of the blue with these criticisms. Tom's actually seen bureaucracy. And, well, he's seen these initiatives fail. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, 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 very, in very direct and kinetic ways in some cases. I mean, so my initial set of government experience was in the United States Marine Corps as an enlisted infantryman fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. So, you know, it's like the, the least effective, most effective organization on planet earth. Um, and then, uh, worked for the, did some work for some other law enforcement agencies for a little while. And then I, uh, I worked for department of energy as well, doing industrial control system security, where I dealt with this exact problem, like every day. And, uh, I started that, I was there in 2013 is when I started that job. And if you want me to tell you that in a decade, we've made a, just a massive improvement, I would be lying to you because we have not. So there are things that can be said um, that should be mandatory. Now, this is where the government gets in trouble though, right? Is they don't want to be the arbiter of that. And they want to, they want to allow the market to kind of dictate what that means. Um, so, you know, whenever you do that, the market's going not going to dictate anything. Like how, how many, 
how big is the boneyard of unenforceable government standards and frameworks? I mean, we can walk through there for years. But there is a play with the government leaning in and providing some requirements. I'm going to use an analogy here with medical devices. Why are we going after companies who make one medical device? And, you know, not to say that we shouldn't hold them accountable. We 100% should. But that that's operating under this under this false premise that the big companies don't have problems when they obviously do. But what do they have that the small company does not have? And I'll let everybody come up with that answer on their own. So, yeah, I agree that, you know, even the FDA, once again, uh, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a perfect expert here, but, you know, my understanding is basically. You submitted that you submit a device and that process takes a long time. Well, I can guarantee you of one thing that it's going to be riskier when it comes out of that process than when it went in. In 100 percent of the cases, software components don't like mature when they just sit there. That's not how it works. So if you submit a medical device that is going to go into the market and it sits in some review process for whatever, a year, there's, 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 no, there's no universe where that device comes out more secure than, than it went in. None. So it's kind of like a contradictory assessment methodology in some cases. So... Back to the labeling concept. I don't really see that moving into the market. I don't think people are going to choose one product over another because of a IoT security rating. That's just my perspective. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. Consumer, for sure. Consumers are going to buy what they buy. Whatever like is the easiest to use and easiest to whatever. Here, here's the problem. People, whenever you're trying to sell something from a security perspective like this, it's not going to work. But when you say, listen, when you do X, Y, or Z things, that is going to save you all of this time down the road. When you, when, when another vulnerability comes out, IOT security camera manufacturer, we want you to have visibility into all of the components that exist on this device that you've built. So when there is a problem, you can answer those questions rapidly and don't waste all this time and don't do this and don't do that. And you don't end up in Hacker News or whatever it is. And the operational efficiencies that you will gain as a result of going through this process will exceed the, the time and capital spent to provide this security outcome, which is, which is just a byproduct of doing the right thing, which is just a byproduct of creating a more operationally efficient whatever. And in so doing also happens to create a more secure product at the end of the day. That's the way it needs to be couched and like and like laid out for people. If you just say to them, thou shalt do X, Y, and Z, they're just going to be like, thou shalt will not do that because you don't make it mandatory. So, you know, it, it, it just goes back like there's, there's so many frameworks and standards out there. Like here's the one that always makes me laugh the most. Uh, like NIST 800-171 or like these CMMC things in the federal government that talk about like CUI, controlled unclassified information. And the, I mean, the LinkedIn warriors on the, on the, on the side of those frameworks are just amazing. Um, they act like the prime contractors care at all. It's so funny. They very obviously don't care at all because those are the people who would have to go down and audit the subprime contractors to ensure that they meet these requirements, which by the way, none of them do because they're all like small businesses. It's like some, it's like some welding shop in New Orleans who has a $50 million contract to make one naval ship door. You think they have like advanced endpoint protection? Are you out of your mind? Um, I'm here to tell you they don't. And so what's the benefit from a company like General Dynamics to go down and audit them and determine that they failed the audit? Are they going to just like make ships without ship doors? Like the, the incentives are so misaligned. They're so nonsensical. Like they've created a set of circumstances where you're, where the, not, where the best decision is to not do anything and not care at all. And that's ex it's just exactly what happens. So I just, it, it just, it's all, it's just noise, right? 
It's like, we have to give the illusion that we're doing the right thing, guys. So we're going to create another special publication um, and put it out. And that's what they do. Given all that, would Tom agree that security is a subset of quality? Well, think about what quality means. So is it quality? Like if you want to, if you're building something, anything on planet earth, if I'm building a house, should I just use lead paint? I mean, that's what people use, right? Should I just use asbestos for insulation? Or should I use the new thing? Should I use the newest thing? I mean, it's such an obvious, it's such an obvious decision matrix, right? Yeah. I mean, and by the way, there are scenarios where you shouldn't use the newest thing for whatever, like, you know, it wasn't tested enough or blah, 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 blah. Um, it came from this place. Like there's other, there is other decision criteria there. It shouldn't just always be the newest, but in a lot of cases, like the, you know, if you just, if you just sat down and asked somebody who was building something like, Hey, are all of the software components you're using in this device that you're about to sell to people, are any of them older than three years old? Any of them? I, 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 I say this with only a tinge of a joke involved, I think you would be hard pressed to find a single device on planet earth um, that does not have at least one component that is more than three years old on it. I don't think I, I, I would, I would, I would be very surprised if there, unless there's only one component on that particular firmware image or something. Um, but I think you would have a very, very hard time producing something like that. And we're working with the device manufacturers that are Fortune 10s who have who are pushing out things with components that are 10, 15 years old that are brand new, that cost a lot of money, that do very important things. What Tom is alluding to is the Software Bill of Material, or SBOM. Think of it as an ingredient label on the side of a box of cereal. It's a way for a vendor to see what the supply chain is providing in terms of open source packages and even the versions of those open source packages. This transparency is a great first step, and it's advocated by CISA as a way to secure our critical infrastructure. Still, given what sounds like a lot of negativity around how we currently do things today, I'm wondering if Tom has any positive things to say about where we are as an industry. I mean, all of these things are positive, right? So the labeling scheme is positive. The massive SBOM initiatives that have come out from the federal government are incredibly positive. This desire to have transparency across the entire supply chain is positive, right? Um, my, you know, it's, I guess here's what's fascinating to me is, you know, I've been in cybersecurity for 18 years-ish. Um, I thought I like had a decent handle on like what was going on. And frankly, starting this company has been like, I don't know anything. Um, like the problems are so massive. Uh, they're so just un unimaginably big. Um, it's like, why would you even target a Windows operating system? Why would you even bother? Why would you even bother? When 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 the thing that is directly connected to the internet, a firewall, a, a border router is running things that are so old um, and so easy. Um, and by the way, attackers are, no are noticing that now they know that these windows operating systems and everything else, like, like phishing, like all that stuff has gotten really, really good. Um, so, I mean, the positive thing here is that it is very obviously changing, um, in a, in a positive direction. Uh, these S bomb initiatives are, are great. You know, typically I would, um, not be a very big supporter of public private partnership kind of stuff from the government but that is a that is a rare case where like the s bomb stuff is just amazing um that was started at the ntia and now is being operationalized by CISA. um and uh the market is reacting to that so i can't speak for what what the government's goal was necessarily um, but the fact that S bombs are not mandatory, but customers are demanding them anyways, 
almost should have been the goal, right? If you can do something that you don't make mandatory and people do it anyways, that's that's how you do it. Um, and and that 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 kind of highlights the obvious nature and value of transparency, of which an S bomb is but one way to provide it. So um, that's a very positive thing, right? Like we have customers who it, it really drives me out of my mind when I see people post about stuff like S bombs will never happen or they'll never be widely adopted because there's no government regulation. I'm like, point me towards the firewall regulation, point me towards the antivirus regulation, point me towards any of these things. And they go, well, those things are things because they're just like so obviously required. And I just, I just looked them in the eyes and go, I think you answered your own question. Um, so yeah, of course, of course. And you're telling me that how is critical security control number one, asset inventory and knowing where all your devices are and critical security control number two, knowing what all your software components are. And then we just skip this critical security control number. I think it's like 18, which is like anti-malware. And those are in priority order. So help me understand like what, what position you're operating from that makes like any logical sense. Um, so, and now companies are going to their device manufacturers and saying to them, like, we're not asking you for an S-bomb. Like we're, we're telling you that you're going to give us one or we're going to go to someone who will. And that is a very positive sign. Um, obviously we stand to benefit from that. Um, but that's kind of, that, that's not, I, 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 you know, I say this all the time and my investors hate it. Like I really don't, it, I care much more about the problem than the financial outcome. If you do the right thing and you build a technology that works and you solve an actual real problem, uh, which is a really novel concept, um, things will probably work out for you. And so that's kind of how we've aligned here and not gotten distracted by a number of other things that could have definitely made us more money at least in the near term. I'd like to thank Tom Pace for coming on the show to wade through the vulnerabilities in the IoT space and how we need to ask more questions about the software and the firmware in our devices and what realistic options we have to make sure that when it hits the consumer, they don't have to deal with endless updates and patches. They just know that the device will work as intended. That's a lot to think about, and I'll continue to chip away at facets of this particular problem in future podcasts. Hey, if you're enjoying Error Code, tell a friend. I'm sure there are other people out there who like narrative information security podcasts. And I'd really like to hear from you. DM me at robertvomosi at infosec.exchange on Mastodon and tell me what you like and even what you don't. Hey, I've got some great episodes coming up, including using EDRs to attack enterprises and more on IoT and OT, of course. Subscribe today. I don't want you to miss out.